that is the end of all the like micro reports. And so now if Shannon is there and wants to say anything more about Kairos National, I'm sorry. I just want to say a little bit about the work at uh, Kairos National at this point is really to lift up the voices of um, partners around the world. So the idea for sending a delegation to COP really came from global partners. Partners like the, the women in Africa that we work with on an ongoing basis who said our voices need to be represented at these global climate conversations. And that is uh, why Kairos is sending delegates and um, really working hard with For the Love of Creation as well to highlight these voices to people all across Canada. So I'm going to do my best to share some of those with you today, but I would also encourage you to go to the Kairos website and seek out the videos yourself of these delegates. I'll only show you a, a few if I can, and there are many more. There are 10 delegates and um, also to join us on November 3rd for a um, conversation with the delegates. Note that that event is in the morning. Um, and so for Western folks, perhaps very early in the morning, um, it would, let's see, you're in uh, mountain time, it will be 6.30 a.m., which is to accommodate our folks in the Philippines and um, Africa and the Middle East, and this was what we landed with. Um, there will also be a recap in the evening so that we can have uh, a conversation about it. Those conversations will be recorded. And there are several other things going on um, throughout the next month to highlight these voices. One is a youth poster contest. And so if you know anyone under 30 who likes to uh, share messages about climate justice, encourage them to put them on paper or online digital com communications and put them into the poster contest. We have a special group of animators who are um, animating the words of the delegates and may have more opportunities to meet with the delegates. If you want into that group, let me know. Um, and then on the weekend in the middle of two weeks of global climate meetings, we're encouraging everyone across Canada to hold candles for COP. And that's an opportunity um, for you to just be in solidarity with the folks that are in Egypt, but also with uh, folks across the country. And so the encouragement is to hold a, a candlelit vigil in your location and to let people across the country know we're going to put it up on our For the Love of Creation website and um, let people know that you're doing that in Calgary or Regina or Saskatoon or wherever you are. Um, do it locally and join with other folks doing it around the globe and that week around across the country that weekend around the globe on the Saturday. Um, so those are a few ways that you can get involved. And now I wonder, hope that you can sit back and uh, listen to the words of the delegates themselves. And I've been playing a little bit with um, controls here, but it's hard to do that without cutting somebody else off. So we're going to give this another try. Give me a moment here as needs a few um, Okay, what I think I need to do for today is um, 
I'm going to show you. Oh, there it is. Here we go. This is the first one I want to share. This is Clifford. Um, Hi, my name is Clifford Musquash. I'm a member of Pagrashin, or Pays Plot First Nation, on the north shore of Lake Superior. I currently live and work in Thunder Bay, Ontario, uh, and I was born and raised in Sulacut, Ontario, on the traditional territory of Lac Seul First Nation. I'm currently a master's in public health student at Lakehead University, and I'm completing a specialization in Indigenous and Northern Health. My research and my practice interests are on ways to decolonize Indigenous health research in ways in which we can work to provide a more equitable level of access to, to the pursuit of health for Indigenous people on Turtle Island. Climate change has affected the livelihoods of people in Northwestern Ontario with increased flooding and wildfires throughout the year, sometimes requiring either the partial or full relocation of people or the community. Indigenous people were environmental stewards of Turtle Island since time immemorial and cared for the environment in a way that was enough to support our livelihoods while still protecting it for uh, use by future generations. For the Anishinaabe, we understand ourselves to be extensions of the land and the land to be a part of us. I think when we see ourselves in the environment and see the environment in ourselves, decisions taken by governments across all jurisdictions and industries will produce policy and action that not only pr prioritize environmental protection and mitigate the effects of climate change, but these decisions and these actions will also improve the health of all people on Turtle Island. Miigwech. Hi, my name is Clifford Musquash. Mm -hmm. I'm a member of Pagashin or Pace Plot First Station on the North. <laughs> Did you catch that line about the land? The Anishinaabe see themselves as an extension of the land and the land as an extension of us. Um, that I think is key and fits very well with um, the embodied uh, conversation that was going on here this morning in terms of how we connect with nature. I want to share with you the video from another of the delegates. Uh, her name is Yusra Shapi. And I will invite you to listen for the um, encouragement that she gives us to support these bills in the House of Commons that will work towards ending environmental racism. Hello. My name is Yusra, and I'm one of the youth delegates that will be participating in COP27 in Shunmul Sheikh this year. I work with Development and Peace, Care to Canada, and I am honoured to be joining this delegation. A little bit about me is that I am an international student from Kuwait studying at the University of Toronto, specialising in psychology and minoring in environment and behaviour. The application of mental processes and the lenses of human behavior have played a pivotal role in informing my approaches to the ecological crisis and the environment in general. They have also brought to light numerous issues. These include dimensions such as eco-anxiety, which is defined as hopelessness, despair, and deep-rooted anxiety about the future of the world due to climate-related issues. This is a condition that becomes progressively more and more pervasive in our youth. These lenses have also allowed me to gain a more transdisciplinary understanding, especially with regards to how the climate crisis disproportionately affects minority communities, Indigenous communities, and communities in the Global South. We call upon the Canadian federal government to take more stringent measures to stick to the agreed-upon terms of the Paris Accord, achieve more at COP27 this year, and push for and adopt bills such as C226. 
an act that proposes to assess and address environmental racism and to advance environmental justice. Finally, we urge the Canadian public to stay up to date, not only with the environmental issues faced by Canada, but also the environmental issues faced by the rest of the world. After all, we all share the home that is planet Earth. Now, I'm not sure exactly what that looked like for you, if it looked like anything. Sound, but not video. So we're going to try one more piece from um, in a different format from USRA. As we went through the entire month of September, focusing on decolonizing climate action, um, we ended it all with a fabulous evening uh, with three panelists that spoke um, about personal experience and their professional um, expertise on the areas specifically around environmental racism. And Yusser was again invited to wrap up the evening and she was able to highlight um, several different um, aspects of the conversation so you'll get a bit of a flavor for it in just five minutes and then hopefully you will have heard enough to pique your interest and um, go back and listen to the whole evening session So first of all, I'd just like to thank the panelists so much for their time and their conversation. I wish I could touch upon and just talk about everything you all talked about today, but unfortunately I don't have the time to do that. So for Anupama's sake, I'm going to run through this as fast as I can. Um, as an international student, I had relatively no knowledge of Canada Canada's colonial history. What was worse than in my classes and courses, I was still not exposed to any of that information. Decolonization is something that is not a part of my syllabus and is often not brought up. One of our panelists said it best. Decolonization is not about engaging in a certain is, is about engaging in a certain level of discomfort and is not a buzzword. However, institutions and educational institutions specifically choose not to engage in that discomfort. The IPCC has also finally named colonialism as a driving force of the climate crisis. Yes, finally, it's about time. <laughs> that is a mold that I'm inspired to help break at COP27 and in my correspondence. I'm committed to using my own privilege to ensure that I am transparent about discomfort and uncomfortable topics, which includes topics of loss, damage, and reparations. Because as strange as it sounds, I think discomfort is part of what mutually respectful communication entails. One of our panelists brought up that a large part of colonization is engaging in deep discussions. That's exactly what I'm hoping to do as part of my correspondence. After all, all action starts with conversation, just like the ones we're having now. I think a big part of my COP27 communication approach is going to involve two-sided conversation. It is going to involve audiences allow them to ask questions and give them a chance to provide their own answers and to respond. That's the best way to get more and more people involved and passionate. After all, as one of our panelists has said, mindsets are as important to be decolonized as policies are. Another one of our panelists also briefly touched upon the concept of environmental racism. The idea of the global South being disproportionately affected by the activities of the global North. What I've noticed in my day to day life is that people know that this happens, but they are completely unaware of what and how much this actually entails. This brings up listening to those who are most affected by the climate crisis. For one of my classes, I was recently assigned an article about environmental racism. It was chock full of statistics and examples, but not a single quote, not a single interview. 
safe to say I absolutely obliterated that article and the choice to include it in the syllabus in my reflection paper, emphasizing how important it is to include voices, to include the humanity. However, it is worth noting that this has to be done extremely carefully and respectfully. Our panelist talks about purposeful solidarity and how some movements are harmful and all about pitting communities against one another, partly what movements such as Extinction Rebellion do to an extent. It reminds me about how a lot of climate crisis discourse comes down to what about us? We're the ones who are suffering, which is a narrative that needs to be changed and flipped on its head. Equity is about making sure all voices are heard, not just the ones they want us to hear. This is something I hope to advocate for and engage with in all my COP27 communications. The topics of resilience were also brought up. I'm reminded of the quote, we should not call people resilient without calling out the systems that have forced them to be resilient. I'd like to tie this into the discussion of unsettling foundations, as one of our panelists very perfectly put it, which are achieved by both personal relational change as well as institutional change. Our panelists touch upon how scary it is, for lack of a better word, to change institutions because they are inherently colonialist. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't talk about it. That doesn't mean reparative justice is a discourse that should be ignored or stowed away, and that we shouldn't call out racist power structures and hierarchies. All of these contribute heavily to the climate crisis and something I, I aim to highlight in my communications. Furthermore, one of our panelists talked about growth and exponential growth and the idea of it being harmful. I'm reminded of a discussion I had with one of my professors. We discussed the use of GDP as a primary measure of this growth, but how does this one measure encompass all that matters to us? Spoiler alert, it doesn't. <laughs> we need to have newer, greener metrics, all of which have to involve this sort of institutional decolonization and breaking down of structures. Jacinda Ardern has famously said, New Zealand will no longer be a growth economy further reinforcing the idea that a growing economy, but a suffering climate as if is a failure, not a success, as she refers to it. Our panelists also brought up the idea of power and how it's not just about redistributing power, but by changing systems and redefining power. I have to say this is a perspective that I will not only carry to COP27, but throughout my life. For some context, the COP27 agenda is arranged in a thematic format this year. Each day will be dedicated to addressing a different topic, and it is now more evident to me than ever that these themes themselves are dictated by power structures. This is why I love this. This is why I love doing the work I do. I learn a lot and have a lot to learn. I aim to immerse myself more in the literature surrounding power structures so that in attending COP27 and in my communications about COP27, I'm well aware of the uneven dynamics at play and how they should be redefined. Finally, I'd like to draw inspiration from the roots of one of our panelists, because Mia Motley puts it best. Our world knows not what is gambling it with, and if we don't control this fire, it will burn us all down. So yes, to conclude, decolonizing climate action is definitely a good idea. The fabulous delegates collected, amazing people from different parts of the world, from different walks of life, from different life experiences. And I invite all of you to join us in whatever way you can to support them and to listen and to lift their voices. I'm going to uh, spend a couple minutes now, if you're still online, dropping a few links in the chat that you can take a look at and I'll send them by email to all the rest, to everyone. And so I thank you very much for your patience with my technical difficulties and for listening today. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Uh, Shannon, yeah. Um, we've had a full day, and I don't know how you're feeling right now. Um, there's been a lot of information at the very end here, and it might be hard to really absorb all of that. Um, I hope more than anything, what you take with you is the connections with you've made with people, knowing that there's somebody out there who you can you can go to. If you don't remember everything you heard, there's someone you can go to to find out and to learn more if you need to. Um, this has sometimes in my work, I'm also a pastor in my day job, and sometimes I feel like I spend so much time getting to know really interesting people and learning all about what they're up to and saying like, 
will you meet my friend? I have a friend here who's doing this. Will you meet this other person and try to put you together? Um, and today feels a lot like that as well, uh, helping people connect with each other um, here in this room and also online. And, uh, and that feels right. We need to get to know each other a little bit better. So now if you are feeling overwhelmed or if you're feeling <laughs> optimistic or encouraged, um, where, whatever you're feeling, let's begin to prepare to leave. I've asked Sarah, uh, Sarah, right? I'm forgetting people's names. <laughs> I've asked Sarah to help guide us, um, send us on our way in a good way. Um, and um, for myself, I think we need to return to that place we were at in the morning of hope, all those, all those practices of silence, of, of stilling ourselves. And uh, that spiritual grounding for all this action we've heard, it doesn't happen without the spirit. Well, with this invitation to provide some closing as I was preparing, I came across a poem that we used in um, some of the Green Exodus sessions that we held. And it's a poem um, by an indigenous poet whom um, Tony still also quoted today. Um, she was the poet laureate three times in the United States and her name is Joy Harjo. So I think her words gather up a lot of what we've been speaking to. So I invite you to just let her words carry the, the buzz inside you, the concern, the questions, the fullness. Let the words teach you. Remember the sky that you were born under. Know each of the star stories. Remember the moon. Know who she is. Remember the sun's birth at dawn. That is the strongest point of time. Remember sundown and the giving away tonight. Remember your birth, how your mother struggled to give you form and breath. You are evidence of her life and her mother's and hers. Remember your father. He is your life also. Remember the earth, whose skin you are. Red earth, black earth, yellow earth, white earth, brown earth, we are earth. Remember the plants, trees, animal life, who all have their tribes, their families, their histories too. Talk to them, listen to them. They are alive poems. Remember the wind, remember her voice. She knows the origin of this universe. Remember, you are all people and all people are you. Remember, you are this universe and this universe is you. Remember, all is in motion, is growing, is you. Remember, language comes from this. Remember, the, lang the dance language is, that life is. Remember. Thank you, Joy. Thank you everyone online. I'm gonna, I think, turn off the Zoom in the room here and uh, we'll start wrapping up. Bye everyone.